Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. Want to improve your organization's customer service? Looking for insider tips to knock your customer socks off? Then you're in the right place. Here's your host, Yannick Grant. Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. On today's episode, we have with us two very special guests. We have a returning guest, Dr. Peter S. Fader, and we have with us one of his very, very special colleagues, Sarah E. Toms. Now, Sarah is an executive director and co-founder of Wharton Interactive, where she has built award-winning ed tech teams that develop highly engaging games and simulations, which are played by tens of thousands of students globally. Her drive to modernize, transform, and democratize education led her to co-invent Simple.World, an open-source simulation framework. As an entrepreneur for more than a decade and a demonstrated thought leader in the technology field, Toms has founded companies that build global CRN product development, productivity management, and financial systems. And so we also have with us... um, a second guest, and that is Dr. Peter Fader. And Dr. Fader was with us uh, maybe a little over a year ago, um, where he spoke to us about customer centricity and customer lifetime value. And so we're just, you know, pleased to have him back on our show with one of his colleagues. So just to give you a, a quick synopsis, Dr. Fader is also the author of Customer Centricity, Focus on the Right Customers for Strategic Advantage. And he is also a part of the Wharton School um, at the University of Pennsylvania team. So without further delay, welcome Sarah and Peter. Thank you, Unique. Good to talk to you again. Awesome. Okay, so could you just give us, you know, a little breakdown? Um, I got a copy of the book and I haven't finished reading it yet. I think I'm on chapter four, but it's been really, really amazing. The journey that I've been on, you know, you know, reading some of the things that you guys have really expanded on from the first book. So could you tell us, you know, some of the things that really propelled you to take it a step further? especially focusing on the difference between customer centricity and customer lifetime value and how an organization can really identify what that is for them. Absolutely. So let me build a bridge from the first book to, to the new one and to the simulation uh, that you mentioned that, that Sarah has, has developed. So the first book was about this radical idea that, that a company can potentially make more money and have more sustainable, defendable success by focusing more on the differences among its customers, by celebrating heterogeneity, that if we can figure out who the right customers are and kind of double down on them, enhance their value, find more like them, that that could do better than just obsessing over version 2.0 of the product. But the thing about the first book, it was, it was good, and I hope that if people haven't read it, they will, but it was more definitional, motivational, aspirational. It's here's this concept. Here's what it can do for you. Here's the problems with a lot of companies out there that, that are failing to go in this direction. So it was trying to, to get people to kind of wake up, but it didn't really give them specific guidance how to put one foot in front of another. Uh, and that's one of the things that Sarah and I have tried to do with our sim. Uh, and this new book basically takes a lot of those uh, ideas and, and, and kind of crystallizes them, goes beyond just the simulation, makes them very real. Let's talk about real companies, real actions. Yeah. And so one of the things where Pete and I, uh, so what was interesting to us was when we started writing the book, we actually started to create sort of this uh, Frankenstein. It was a combination of simulation manual and some interesting stories and interesting content about customer centricity and how to actually put customer centric uh, thinking into action. And we brought it to our publisher and they said, you know, get rid of the simulation stuff, flesh out more about the book, make it a standalone piece. If people want to run the simulation and read the book, that's fantastic. But we really need something that uh, engages folks who are working in the trenches day in, day out, and give them a clear guideline for how to become Mm customer-centric. Love it, love it. And in the book, you also focused on the difference between customer-centricity versus product-centricity. Could you share with us a little bit about that? And do you find that organizations are shifting more towards customer-centricity and less in the product realm? So this goes back to some of the concepts in in the first book was – Taking conventional business practices uh, that we just accept as this is just how you run a business. You put the product first. It's all about what what product should we develop? uh, How do we um, fine tune it to meet the the needs of the customer? 
uh, distribution, promotion, all about the old four P's that we talk about in marketing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we're saying, well, no, actually, let's build our business around the customers, the more valuable customers, and have that, instead of saying what product features will be most appealing, we say, here are the most valuable customers. What is it that they want? And so we start looking at, at product development and product management quite differently. And again, uh, when I wrote the first book, it was more about this provocative kind of let's do a 180 on, on the way we think about business. But we still stop short of, of actually saying here's a, an, an overall, well, dare I say, playbook, which, of course, is the name of the new one, yes. uh, to, be, to begin to, to actually not only – embrace the metrics and all the mathy stuff that I like to do, but to think more about how to build the right kind of organization, how to send the right kind of message, how to establish the right kinds of principles. And I think, again, tremendous credit to Sarah for taking some of the best practices from the software world and bringing them over. And Sarah can expand on that. Yeah. So at the end of the book, we have a manifesto, which really comes from my experience in technology and software development Uh, where I experienced uh, something very similar to what I've learned now with partnering with Pete over the last four years, five years, that's happening in, you know, the marketing science world as well. And that is that, you know, we're being inundated with all this data. There's data insights and data collection, and it's becoming cheaper and easier and faster to just collect, you know, swaths and swaths of information about our customers and how they behave and what makes them buy, et cetera. And the problem is, is that a lot of it's garbage. And so we had something similar happen in the software development realm in the dot-com heydays where we had this tremendous capability with technology. And the problem was we were really uh, weighed down by old bureaucratic bloated software processes. I'm talking about you know waterfall uh, where we had to write reams and reams of documentation and we weren't able to work leanly and be able to keep up with the technological advances in a way that was in line with our customers and our business users and what they actually wanted from the software that was being developed. And so this sparked an idea uh, as I was having these conversations with Pete. And I said, you know, I think what we really need for customer centricity is we need a manifesto as well. We need something that will really focus Uh, business people. It will give them just simple clarity around what is important and what they need to double down on with regards to customer centricity. All right. So the book is a playbook. Um, Basically, anybody in an organization um, in a leadership role or non-leadership role can pick up the book and they're able to have a guideline like step by step as to how they can really master customer centricity in their business, whether they're an organization that has customers that come in or they're an online business. True? Yeah. So uh, the way that we've laid out the book from the uh, the playbook perspective there, Unique, is to really think about those different functional areas. And Pete and my goal with this was to, you know, most definitely make sure that this was a cross-functional conversation. This book, playbook, is not just for the salesperson or the marketing person. This is for the data person. It's for the finance people. It's for uh, the folks in HR, the folks who are developing the products, R&D. This is for everybody. And it's really, again, pivoting and pivoting so that your, your customers are at the center, yes, but understanding that there's heterogeneity at play within that customer base and how are you really going to focus in on what you need to do. So when you're thinking about acquiring those customers, when you're thinking about retaining them and developing them, when you're thinking about having conversations with those in your technology team on how to uh, tag them and track them and, and understand what information is actually important when it comes to uh, figuring out who's valuable today, who will be valuable tomorrow, And when I'm acquiring new customers, who's more than likely going to be valuable uh, to the organization? And then taking all of those conversations and making sure that folks in your finance team understand what that means from the customer lifetime value standpoint. Mm. And just to add one other example to that, uh, I think Sarah mentioned that one of those elements being retention and development. We look at the array of new Uh, tactics that that are available to either make your customers more valuable or have them stay around longer. So things like a loyalty program or a premium offering or 
customer experience or strategic account management. And the problem is a lot of these tactics are so new. They just weren't done. They didn't exist a generation ago. Uh, and so companies don't really know which one to use when. Uh, 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 when should you lean uh, towards the loyalty program versus the, the, the premium offering? Uh, you really need a playbook to kind of lay out all these tactics and, and come up with a, a, a solid framework to, to give companies guidance about uh, and you don't invest in all of them, but think strategically and, and have a good idea of, of when it makes sense to, to start one or pivot to another. So that, that's just one example where we're starting to get just much more tactical and starting to deal with issues that just aren't in, let's say, you know, your traditional marketing 101 type course. Mm hmm. Now, could you share with our listeners what are some necessary elements that help to support customer centricity in an organization? Well, I'll, I'll reflect my bias here and then <laughs> Sarah can do <laughs> hers. Uh, for me, a big part of it is all about customer lifetime value. And again, I acknowledge it's a bias because that's the kind of research that I've done. Uh, th those are the kinds of, of, of models and activities that I've, I've commercialized in a couple of different ways. Uh, but uh, to to go to do customer centricity right, you have to be able to have that CLV magic wand. You have to be able to look at a customer's past interactions with you and say, "Here's my best guess about what they're going to be worth in the future," and to line up customers in that future-looking way, and to use those numbers and those differences across customers to really drive all these tactics. So a, a lot of companies are eager to get into the tactics. Man, they want to do that customer experience campaign. Uh, but we're saying it won't be nearly as effective if you don't have a good quantitative assessment of the value of customers before and after you do that kind of campaign. Um, could you give us a live example? Like give us an example of an organization that has utilized this methodology and they've seen, do you know, for us to identify? One of the shining examples that we use a couple of times in the book is electronic arts. So electronic arts is really one of the most mature organizations that we've seen with regards to customer centricity. So every day as players are playing their games, they are collecting data about behaviors, about what they know about who's more than likely going to be a high, medium and low value customer. And they're feeding that information back to the game studios, they're letting them know, you know, for our high value customers, did this uh, part of the game work the way we thought it was going to? Did we see as high engagement as we, we were hoping? And if not, why not? And what do we need to do to pivot in the actual game development? Uh, they're using information about these customers with uh, how they advertise to them. So not keeping, you know, just saying, all right, well, here's our advertising campaign for this game. We'll put it out there. It'll be out there for, you know, a month, three months, five months. They're, they're using that information about their customers to actually fine tune how they target and attract the customers that they're looking to seek. Mm, okay. So it's 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 definitely a combination of a different of many different things all in one um, in terms of an organization looking at how the customer is interfacing with their product or their service, um, the frequency of them utilizing that product of their service and of course the spend. Right. Yeah. RFM is still uh, still key mm -hmm. um, to uh, <laughs> to build on what Peter was saying about customer lifetime value in chapter one. And I'm sure you've already read we spend some time delving into problems with CLV that we see uh, that are common out there and mistakes that are being made with the calculation itself. So CLV itself can be quite complex and there's uh, lots of open source ways to uh, leverage and, and create you know, CLV calculations within your organizations. But we do spend some time going through the mistakes, which should hopefully shine some light on how to be tracking and calculating CLV correctly in your organization. Mm -hmm. And that kind of dovetails nicely into my next question. How is it that you integrate the CLV and align the customer service strategy with a proper CRM solution? So uh, I think we both have something to say about that. Uh, <laughs> so um, on the CLV side, you know, I, I learned so much, not only from the research that I do and interacting with, with kind of students and executives, but uh, through my first startup a company called Zodiac, where we were working with a wide variety of companies, calculating the CLVs for them. Uh, and it was surprising because I really thought, I am just bringing you the CLV. I am the expert here. Take mm -hmm. the CLVs and make money 
rain down from the skies. <laughs> but it was a great learning exercise for me to see the kinds of use cases that companies would, would come up with. And, and actually, Sarah uh, basically gave the list of them a few moments ago, and she was talking about all of the different tactics that you need to understand and, and align and, and do in an accountable way. Customer acquisition, retention, development, you know, that, that, that customer experience campaign. It's not enough just to, to, to give people glasses of champagne when they walk into your store. You have to do the CLV calculation. You have to say, how, much, how valuable were they before this campaign started? How much more valuable are they afterwards? Or, or better yet, or more realistically, how many customers meaningfully increased in value and how many of them are meh, the same as, as ever before? Mm -hmm. So CLV gives us a really good lens, not only to make decisions, but to evaluate decisions after the fact. Uh, and so, again, just seeing the way that companies have, have been using it very creatively, as far as I'm concerned, across a wide variety of functions. And by the way, that includes getting outside of marketing. And maybe in a bit we could talk about the idea of customer-based corporate valuation. Let's get the CFO into this party as well. Uh, so we could talk more about that. But to the other part of your question, Unique, uh, it also goes to having really good CRM systems, which mm -hmm. is a big part of, of Zara's expertise. So how do you know which one's the right one to go with? <laughs> so unfortunately, there aren't any great additions to CRM yet uh, that we've seen. So when in my conversations with a number of the companies that uh, appear in the book, um, so LA Dodgers is a great example. They have had to build their insights outside of, uh, so they, they use Salesforce and they're then doing the analytics sort of outside. They're, they're tracking all of their customers in their CRM, but then they're, they're running uh, different algorithms, et cetera, in other systems, which mm. is unfortunate. So I think, and Pete, I think you'd agree that a lot of the companies that you've been working with in the, um, they, they're having to kind of roll their own, if you will, uh, because there isn't a good solution out there yet. Yeah, and that is that is unfortunate. We, we were in the process, we were creating that solution through through my uh, company, Zodiac, but uh, Nike bought that firm, which was, of course, a wonderful outcome, uh, but now it's all <laughs> under the swoosh. Um, uh, so we really hope that companies can learn from those experiences, and again, a lot of that uh, through that, that we're trying to uh, convey in the book, both laying out these frameworks as well as these uh, specific company profiles that, that Sarah's been referring to. Yeah, and just to go back to your original uh, question there, Unique, was the, the the whole point, everybody thinks, okay, well, customer service, um, you know, it's to turn ugly ducklings into beautiful swans. <laughs> and this is another point in the book is that, you know, really think, and this was to Pete's earlier point, we've got all of these sort of ways that we engage with our customers, ways to increase CX quality, ways to increase, hopefully, customer loyalty. But it's very rare that you take somebody from your bottom tier from a customer lifetime value standpoint and boost them all the way up uh, to the very top. And so rather than think that you can do that and expend a tremendous amount of energy uh, trying to achieve that impossible dream, just look at what you're doing and understand who you're serving from a CLV standpoint. So customer service is really for your lower value customers. Um, and the same with loyalty programs, like understand that that's who you're really targeting those types of programs to. Mm -hmm. Understood, understood. All right. Now, could you share with us a little bit about the loyalty programs in terms of how does the loyalty program, does every organization need a loyalty program in order to have an effective um, or have a true reflection of what their customer lifetime value is to understand the whole metric process? So the, the answer is no, and, and a lot of companies are finding that the hard way because yeah. there, there's this lemming-like behavior out there that, oh, we got to have one too. It's a box that we need to check. Some of our competitors have one. and um, So that's why we really try to come up with a framework that says, under what circumstances do you really need a loyalty program? Mm -hmm. And as Sarah just said, and if you think about it logically, uh, you know, a buy nine, get one free, you know, just kind of a basic loyalty program – that's not appealing to your top platinum customers. They're going to buy from you all the time anyway. They're looking to deepen the engagement, not necessarily just to buy more stuff. Mm -hmm. um, whereas for those middle to lower customers, if we could get them just to buy a little bit more often, 
um, th that that's how we can uh, create more value out of them. So so a big part of it is that loyalty program is is aimed more at the the middle to lower tier of your customer value pyramid. And if that's where your main strategic focus is at a given time, then 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 great. That that's the way to go. But too many too, too often. Uh, companies are thinking about the loyalty program as as something that would be appealing to or aimed at the tippy top customers. And again, they're with you not because of points, not because of bonuses. Put it this way: if that's why they appear to be really valuable customers, if if it's all because of the you know uh, the, the 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 goodies that come from the loyalty program, then they're not really loyal. <laughs> then you're kind of bribing them to be with you. So you want to find ways to appeal to the high value customers. Uh, that that's that's just a, a, a very different kind of thing. Something like a premium offering, um, where the, it's not a matter of giving them stuff. It's actually a matter of getting them to actually potentially pay a little bit more to kind of show their loyalty, to show that they they want to have a different kind of relationship with you, that they want to have that kind of badge of honor to show that they're different than most customers. So we're trying to bring some some logic and discipline to things like loyalty programs and customer experience and customer service that we feel just doesn't exist anywhere out there to date. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right. So we've spoken a little bit about customer centricity and um, customer lifetime value. And of course, you know, how the book is, the, how the book is framework and how it can impact um, an organization. Um, based on your experience, you know, your research, um, your exposure, different interactions that you've had with different people, how do you view customer experience today and what do you think it will look like five to 10 years from now? Because it's constantly changing, right? Yeah, we actually, uh, we have a new blog post uh, or article coming out very soon that talks about uh, customer experience and the fact that it is not customer centric. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thankfully, there are, and uh, we outline this in our uh, upcoming article, there are just a few small steps that, that organizations could be taking to become more customer centric when it comes to CX. So I would um, alluded to this earlier in the conversation. You know, when we're talking about CX, we're looking at um, different ways to really reduce the friction that our customers feel when they're uh, interacting with us, with our brand, et cetera. And there are many different ways to measure CX, you know, and how we're doing with, re with respect to CX, whether it be CX quality, which is measured by effectiveness, ease, and emotion, mm -hmm. or customer loyalty, which is measured by advocacy, otherwise known as uh, net promoter score, enrichment, and retention. And one of the problems that Pete and I have is that these CX measurements, these metrics are one dimensional. You know, they, they, they don't really tell us anything else that's happening with respect to our customer and that interplay with the brand. And so what we've done with this article is we've created another framework where we're looking at these CX metrics against switching costs and switching costs, as we know, are a way to measure another form of friction that our customers are experiencing. And so what we've done in this new framework is we've said, okay, if we're, if we're looking at high switching costs um, against our CX metric and we're doing really, really well with customers, we've got caged customers, but they're very loyal and they're happy to be with us. Mm -hmm. what, we sh what should we be doing with them versus customers who have got a low CX metric and low switching costs? So those are our revolving dorists, if you will. And that's where something like a loyalty program might come in. You know, so they, they don't have a lot of friction from the standpoint of staying with us. We want to try to raise that a little bit so they do stay with us more and we can extract a bit more value from them. So a loyalty program uh, would be perfect for them. And then for anybody who is kind of stuck with us because of high switching costs, but they've got a high value, let's look at making them happier while they're, they're kind of stuck with us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we want to keep them engaged and then, you know, hopefully once competition comes in or those switching costs may be lower, we still are able to retain them as high value customers. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Those are excellent points to keep in mind. All right. So we'll definitely, if you could share with us um, maybe the link for that resource so that we can put it in the show notes of this episode. So our listeners could definitely tap into some of that information that you have in that blog post. Definitely. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, could you guys share with us maybe uh, one online resource tool, website, or app that you absolutely can't live without in your day-to-day -day operations? 
<laughs> for me and my team, so I am, uh, you know, I'm still a technologist. You know, I've, I've had the absolute pleasure and honor of being able to write this book and really uh, double down in, on the way I think about my customers that I'm designing technology for. And agile is uh, what I live and breathe by. So I work with teams that are international. I bring the best of the best to the table, and I don't really care where their brain is as long as I get to leverage their brain. And being able to run lean teams is very important to me. And so Slack is my go-to. Um, and this is a way that I'm able to communicate very quickly and rapidly with my teams. Um, and then also where I'm actually tracking software changes and my sprints and that uh, kind of thing. So we use GitLab and Jira uh, to do a, a lot of that management. And that kind of approach, that lean approach is um, something that, you know, again, we talk about in the playbook and the importance. All right. Peter? Uh, I, I shouldn't admit it, but <laughs> um, I'm I'm addicted to Twitter. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I just find, uh, whether it's for, you know, news, sports, entertainment, but also uh, uh, just a whole bunch of people that I follow, uh, always looking for, for best practices of, of how companies are using their, their, their customer level data. So just, you know, the, a, a million anecdotes a day, some, some good, some appalling. Uh, but it's, it's just a, a great way to learn a lot of different stuff and then, you know, make up your own mind about uh, which is, is good and which is not so good. Uh, but but good to have that, that kind of broad exposure. I don't read books anymore because, uh, uh, I mean, Twitter is, 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 is the fire hose that, that, that uh, really keeps me attached to the world. All right. Okay. So we'll have the links to those um, apps um, that Sarah shared with us. And of course, I'm sure all of our listeners know about Twitter. So maybe if they're not as engaged, they could possibly um, utilize some of that access as well. Now, in writing the book, um, the Customer Centricity Playbook, and also the book you wrote before, um, Peter, um, are there any books that as you've developed into this whole role of customer centricity and, you know, you've played such a pioneering role in it and Sarah in her capacity, you know, in terms of being a pioneer in the technology role, are there any books that have had really great impacts on you that you'd like to share with our listeners that you think will help them in their own journey? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention a couple, but I'm, I'm really, I actually am very interested to, to see what Sarah has to say because as she was starting to develop this simulation and then uh, uh, write the book, um, she took a whole bunch of books off my shelf over here. <laughs> Kept some of them for a little too long, actually. But, uh, <laughs> um, so it's uh, so interesting to hear uh, which, which ones she said were the ones that really uh, shaped her thinking the most. But I'll tell you which one uh, is uh, at the top of my list. It's an oldie but a goodie, and I'm curious if, if your uh, listeners are even aware of it. It's really one that got a lot of these ideas started. It's a book called The Loyalty Effect by Frederick Reicheld. Kind of interesting, because he's a Bain consultant, not an academic. And this was a book he wrote back in 1996, which is 500 years ago, for all <laughs> intents and purposes, uh, and basically laid out this idea that not all customers are created equal, and if we could figure out who the just right ones are, then all of these great things are going to happen. It'll be this virtuous cycle and once we find those customers, because they'll be they'll stay with us longer, they'll buy more often, they'll be cheaper to serve, they'll be uh, strong advocates for us, they'll make a lot of referrals, um, and so it, it, it was laying out this idea that 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 loyalty manifests in lots of different ways and and provides this kind of multiplier source of value. It's just a matter of figuring out who those just right customers are. Mm -hmm. uh, and they kind of stopped short of that. They didn't talk about lifetime value and so on. Uh, but I think it really was something that, that started this conversation. Uh, and a lot of us today, especially the younger generation, thinks that we've been talking about these ideas forever. But really, until the mid-90s, they were just not part of the conversation. True. Very true. Sarah? Yeah. Uh, so books for me and Pete's right. I mean, I did so much wonderful reading uh, and thank you, Pete, for your amazing library <laughs> and, <laughs> and con contribution to that. Um, I actually I stumbled across. So, uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning of the interview that our, you know, our guiding goal with this book was to land in that cross functional space and to really try to ignite a conversation about really the organizational and cultural changes that must happen mm -hmm. cross-functionally in organizations in order for customer centricity to really take root. 
And I stumbled on this book called The Silo Effect, The Peril of Expertise and the Promise of Breaking Down Barriers by Jillian Tett. And it is a fantastic book that just it's one case study after another of where breaking down the siloing effect that happens in organizations where that has been good for some organizations and where it's existed, where it's been uh, really perilous and uh, difficult. So that's one book I, I most certainly recommend. Other book that I recommend is Matthew Dixon. He's got a number of uh, amazing books in the CX space, including The Effortless Experience. There's an HBR article about not trying to delight your customers, uh, but this gentleman really has it right that you know you shouldn't be trying to overdo it with every single customer. Um, and he has written some incredible books in the CX space as well. So we'll definitely have access to those um, books that you shared. Um, and I am familiar with um, with Fred Reichland because he, he I wrote I read a couple of years ago and I just started this business. Um, the ultimate question. Um, yes, I haven't indeed. I haven't read the loyalty effect, but he did. He definitely opened my mind up when I read the ultimate question. It, for sure. I, I'm so glad that you made the connection, Yannick. And I was I mean to say it, but better when it's coming from you. Uh, <laughs> again, he laid out these ideas back in '96, but it wasn't until five, almost 10 years later, that he kind of translated them uh, in, into the net promoter score. Yes. Say, this is the metric that's going to help us identify companies that have been doing a good job at, at finding those customers and, and, and deepening those relationships. Yep. So, so a lot of people think that net promoter score just sort of appeared <laughs> in the early 2000s, uh, but the, it was really kind of a decades of, of, of work and thinking and, and just careful consideration by Fred and his uh, colleagues at Bain uh, that, that, that made that possible. And it really, again, that revolution, I think, has sparked a lot of the work that, that we're doing. And, and of course, I have great admiration for the folks over there and, and enjoy my own collaborations with them. Mm -hmm. All right. Could either of you share with us maybe one thing that's going on in your life right now that you're really excited about, either something that you're working on to develop yourself or your people? Well, I'm uh, super happy to talk about my new startup, I mentioned the idea of customer-based corporate valuation. Let's get the CFO involved in this customer centricity <laughs> thing. Uh, so I have a, a new company called Theta Equity Partners, thetaequity.com, and that's exactly what we're doing. It's actually a, it's a finance play. We're actually uh, go, uh, working with a bunch of private equity firms, late-stage venture capitalists, talking to some hedge funds to basically say, let's value your company from the bottom up. Let's look at how many customers you're acquiring, how long are they staying, how many purchases are they making, how valuable are those purchases, add all that stuff up and say that will give us more visibility and more understanding of the value of a company than the traditional Wall Street approach. So we're doing this for real and it's, and it's really working and it's actually creating a meaningful dialogue between CFOs and CMOs that has just never existed before. So it's been just a thrill to expand the conversation in a direction that I never thought I'd even be capable of doing, but to see how receptive uh, the, the finance and, and, and investment audience is for this stuff. Amazing. That's brilliant. Wow. All right, Sarah, is there anything you're working on to develop yourself or your people? I am. So we, um, about a year ago, I launched a new team here at the Wharton School called Wharton School called Wharton Interactive, mm -hmm. and we are building um, platforms to transform education. So when you're looking at creating experiential learning in classrooms, it's expensive, it takes a long time, it's uh, hard to change and uh, fine tune once you've launched uh, experiences. And really what I've discovered over the last six years being in this niche in ed tech is that platforms provide a, a way that forward where we can start to build truly transformational experiences for less cost and ones that we can then uh, fine tune and learn from. Mm -hmm. And so we're leveraging alternate reality gaming. We're leveraging even smaller things like text messaging and social media uh, patterns uh, to really create uh, social learning and de democratizing that educational experience for the learners. So a lot of the work that we've been doing, that I've been doing with Pete in understanding and fine tuning folks' eyes to heterogeneity with customers, 
I've been starting to think about how we bring that into the learning space and creating more uh, fine-tuned and uh, tailored experiences for the learners, knowing that not everybody learns the same way. No, they don't. Yeah. Uh, so that I'm very excited about, very proud of. Uh, you can find out more about what we're doing at interactive.wharton.upenn.edu. Okay, so you've shared with us what you're really excited about and what you're working on. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm especially intrigued by Sarah's um, approach to education. I do think um, it's something that will definitely impact um, customer experience in the long term. You know, when I think about my daughter who is 13 years old and some of the challenges that they have in schools trying to get through to these children with the information that they're trying to simulate, I find that we're teaching children in 2019, but we're using, we're using methods that were applicable in 19. 19- and it's clearly not reaching, you know, the, the, the audience that we're trying to reach now. They're, you know, they just need to be stimulated in a higher way. And so I hope some of the work that you're doing, it materializes that it can stretch to different parts of the world, like Jamaica. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> because, um, you know, I don't know what it's like in the U.S. I'm sure you probably have, you know, greater exposure to better opportunities. But here it's, you know, I can see that the methodology that they're using is definitely not as impactful. And I think um, based on what you are saying, if hopefully that can become more widespread in the long term, these children who will become, you know, business owners or employees in organizations that we're all going to have to be customers of, it would be great, you know, for them to have that experience from early. I, uh, yeah. And one of the problems, so I have a 10 year old son. I also have three teenage daughters <laughs> and we're, we're not just teaching the same way we did in the 1970s. We're teaching the same way we did in, you know, the 1900s. So, oh um, we are, uh, there is a lot of work to be done in, in moving the needle and, uh, very with a lot of pride. I can say that we're, we're doing some amazing work here at the Wharton school and it's with great partners like Pete Fader who are willing to take the leap and who are also pushing and challenging teams like mine to to think outside the box and bring something new to the table for our learners. Yeah, amazing. Okay, can you share with our listeners where they can find you online? So they've listened to this episode, they think what you've shared is amazing and they want to connect with you even further. Where can they find you online? So for me, uh, a, a Two good places would be my faculty webpage, petefader.com. Uh, and I also mentioned this this new uh, startup, fadaequity.com, where it's, it's, you see a lot of the research and a bunch of blog posts and other content related to customer-based corporate valuation. Mm-hmm. And Sarah? Yeah, so for me, it's LinkedIn. Um, so if you just uh, search me on LinkedIn, Sarah, T-O-M-S. Also, Twitter. And I'm Sarah E. Toms. And then, uh, like I said, my website, uh, there's a link there to contact us. And that message will get through to me. Uh, so interactive.wharton.upenn.edu. All and right. let me, if I may, throw one more in. Uh, that that uh, As we put together the customer centricity manifesto as part of the book to try to get this core set of principles that any customer-centric organization should agree on, Go to Customer Centricity Manifesto, all one word, customercentricitymanifesto.org, and sign on there uh, and kind of join this customer-centric revolution. Uh, we're, we're pleased to see how many have done so and uh, only a few billion more to go before we can uh, say we've captured the whole world. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Is there a possibility for the book, this playbook to be um, d- developed into maybe an online course? Uh, interesting. So there are. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I have some uh, older online courses that are more about the kind of original, you know, aspirational, definitional, motivational stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the, the 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 best thing that we have is the the new customer centricity simulation that really brought us together. Uh, and and Sarah could maybe just say a word or two about some of the future plans to make that more accessible online. Yeah, so the, there's two uh, ways. So we've we've got the existing simulation that's uh, most usually it's usually played in teams and usually played uh, you know with faculty or teachers um, who are facilitating the experience. And so we've got that experience. Uh, my team is also starting to work on a Steam-based game. Uh, so. Folks who are interested in learning can just go to Steam and they'll, they'll be able to download a single player game uh, from that marketplace. 
And then uh, I also have uh, designs to work with Pete on creating something in the alternate reality gaming space on our ARC platform. And that will be, uh, you know, a, a massive online offering, uh, hopefully not too far down the, down the road from now. Great. All right. All right. So this was an amazing conversation. Now, before we wrap up our interview, we always like to ask our guests if they have one quote or saying that during times of adversity or challenge, this is a quote that they revert to, to help them to become refocused and just to, you know, just get back on track. Do you have mm. one of those, Peter or Sarah? You know, you, need, you, you caught me again. You asked that wonderful question when we spoke last time and I swung and missed. <laughs> I should have done my homework. Uh, I have one. (laughs) Go for it, Sarah. Okay, and this is from the founder of the University of Pennsylvania, Benjamin Franklin. Um, This is a quote I love, and it is my world. It's, tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. Lovely. I love that. All right. Yes, it's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Like I really connected with everything you said a while ago. (laughs) <laughs> all right so i i think i think sarah covered for you um peter <laughs> uh, it's not the first time won't be the last uh-huh. <laughs> so thank you so much sarah and peter for taking time out of your very busy schedules to sh- sit with us today and share just this amazing work that you're doing you know this wonderful book we're going to have lots of links um in the show notes of this episode um we really appreciate all the nuggets that you shared with us all of the research that you've done and the fact that you're so willing to share this information globally so that other organizations, other people, businesses can really grow and understand how they are leading their business so that they can really step their game up. We really appreciate it. And we really appreciate the great questions you ask and the opportunity for us to get the word out there. All right. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Unique. You're welcome. So until next time, please feel free to visit our Facebook group. We have a closed Facebook group for our listeners and it's Navigating the Customer Experience Community. And feel free to follow us on Twitter at Navigating CX. Until next time, I'm your host, Yannick Grant. Thanks for listening. For more awesome resources to take your customer service game to another level, head over to NavigatingTheCustomerExperience.com. See you next time.